So we want all these things. We want the presence of the Lord on our lives. We want encouragement. We want love. We want to feel the affection and the mercy from God. All the things that we say are the reasons why, you know what, enter into a relationship with the Lord because these are the things that you get. You're not going to get money and you probably won't get fame, but you know what you will get? You get love and compassion and mercy. You get affection. You'll get God's presence in your life. You'll get purpose. And it's all accurate. And Paul says, yes, but wait. You know how you're going to get those things? Let me tell you, as your pastor, he says, let me tell you, this is how you get those things. And then he gives this list that I actually think becomes kind of discouraging. It starts by saying, think the same way. Having the same love. United in spirit, intent on one purpose. Think the same way. I sometimes wonder if any two people even think closely the same way. I feel like the more time goes on and the more that we have things like social media, and everyone has this way that they can get their opinions out into the world and not see someone face to face while they do it, the more we become stuck in our thoughts that are completely different to everyone else. But everyone's thoughts are completely different to everyone else. Think the same way. Saying, but really, like, Paul, are you saying that the Lord actually wants us to all just be robots and think the same? That we're not allowed to have our own thoughts and our own opinions and our own uh, ideas. No, that's not really. You have to take it in context. What does it say? All of it. It says having the same love, united in the same spirit, intent on one purpose. How do we think the same? It means we think the same about the important things. It means we major on the major and we minor on the minor. And sometimes we minor on the... Or we major on the minor. News flash, everything that happened in the last two years, even though it was traumatic and I get all that, guess what, in the grand scheme of eternity, it's still minor. I get an amen? No matter how scary it may have been, especially if you're here and you know the Lord, guess what, it's really minor. Most of the topics that we talk about outside of Christ and Christ crucified and salvation are minor issues, and we make them into major issues. And what he's saying is he's saying you don't have to, the idea isn't that we have to think alike on everything, but when you put the purpose of the Lord, when you put the, unite, uh, you, the unity that we have in the Spirit, when we put all of that into the category that we should put it into, all of a sudden, everything else becomes pretty unimportant. He's saying you can do all these things when you have the same purpose in mind. But even that, even that seems to be a little impossible. It's like, so you expect me to be able to put all of these things aside, all of my ideas, all of my emotions? Because I don't know about you, but when you think you're right on something, and maybe it's just me, but I can get pretty fiery. Anyone else with me? Like, when I think I'm right, you better watch out, because I know what I'm talking about. Now, when I'm sane, do I really? No, I don't. But in the moment, do I feel like it? Absolutely. Can we be honest, right? How many of us feel like that, right? Like, are you all like, what's wrong with you? How do you not see it the same? Wait, we have emotions. We are human. And so you look at this list and you say, that's great in theory, but now try. Try and live it out without, without. Verse 3 and 4. On paper, we will all say, yeah, I get it. Check the box. I know I'm supposed to live with eternity in mind, with love to one another. Another. 
I know that's how I'm supposed to live. But it becomes impossible if we don't actually do a whole lot of work on verse 3 and 4. Let's read verse 3 and 4 again together. You ready? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others. This alelon, this one another, consider the whole as more important than yourself. In those moments, are we looking through that lens of the whole and us being a part of the whole, but the whole being more important than how I feel in this moment? I don't think often we are. Because it is a supernatural thing. It actually comes down to a heart posture before the Lord. I actually don't think, as humans, we have the capability to do this on our own. I think it is something that we need the Lord to do. It's that moment where we realize that we need to rely on Him and not on us. Because in our own strength, we are... Mostly selfish. But God is not. And so we look at his perspective. Now I want to get one thing out of the way, and then we're going to talk a little bit about humility. The one thing I want to get out of the way is, at the end it, it says, you know, or people read this passage, and I actually have been asked this question multiple times, is does that mean I'm not allowed to have any of my own interests? my own desires? Am I not allowed to have my own needs? And, and what does that mean? And no, it actually says this at the very end, right? Verse 4, it says, everyone should look out not, not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. There's this picture that I have my needs, I have my boundaries. It's a good word, but it's a word that we use a lot these days. I have my needs and my boundaries and, and, and what I want and there's everyone else's needs and boundaries and what they want. And what it's saying is it's saying, guess what? Yours aren't more important than theirs. And theirs aren't more important than yours. Together, we need to figure out how we all work together. It's okay to know yourself and to know what your desires are and to figure out ways to, to live out God's purpose for your life. But when you do that in isolation and you forget that, hey, what, it's not just about you, is where, we become, where the problem comes in. So if humility is the key, we need to get over ourselves. Right? If, you, if I was speaking in many other countries in the world, this passage would not be as applicable in the way that I'm sharing it. Why? Because they have an understanding of communal living. They have an understanding that, you know what, what's good for you is also good for me, and there's this give and take, but we don't live in that world. We live in a world where our self is number one. What my feelings are, what my thoughts are, what I do how I interact, that is more important. That's the culture that we live in. And so we need to look at it through that lens and say, okay, if we know that we're probably going to lean to that side as a culture, then we need to be really careful that we aren't. And so it comes down to this idea that we have an inflated view of self as North Americans. We often even read scripture, and I love, James says it all the time, He's like, guess what? Most of the Bible was not written to North Americans. It was written to the Middle East. Even when you read through Revelations, right, it's talking about from a lens of of that area of the world, and we need to read it through that area of the world. We aren't the most important people on the planet. 
We are a part of the whole. And so we need to understand that our, our desires here as North Americans often put self above other things. So how do we do this? I heard a great uh, sermon series. It was called Get Over Yourself by Kyle Edelman. I only listened to part of one sermon, but uh, I want to throw it out there because I'm using some of what he said because I think it's really good. And he talked about this idea of how do we get over ourselves? How do we, how do we actually move past this of what I think about is what I need first? How do we move past this? You get a few things. Here's a few signs that'll tell you that you need to get over yourself. Are you ready? Actually, before I even go to the list, this is probably the first key, is you just thought about five people that needed to hear this sermon instead of you. Right? Because when I heard it the first time, that's what I did. I was like, you know what? You know who really needs to hear this sermon? And the Lord's like, what is wrong with you? Like, are you not even listening? I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I suck. Right? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But uh, number one, you need to get over yourself. This is going to sting. You take things too personally. Someone says something and your feelings get hurt. And then you're like, you know what? We're not talking anymore. Or, you know that person. Anyone else have those moments? You're easily offended. You just take things really personally. Most people aren't going around trying to hurt each other's feelings. It often just comes from we're just not that sensitive sometimes. Those of you who know me and know me well, and I've worked pretty hard at it, but I can be pretty straightforward and blunt, and I often will hurt people's feelings, and I don't mean to. Not as much as I used to, but, you know, you ask me a question, and I assume you want a real answer, so I'm going to give you a real answer. But the problem is, is that most people don't want a real answer when they ask most questions. They want to feel better. <laughs> Took me a long time, and I am now teaching my youngest daughter this ta uh, this because she also struggles with it. She's like, but they asked. Yes, I hear you, but most people <laughs> don't want a real answer when they ask you a question. You take things too personally. Number two, your feelings are the most reasonable. Anyone else? Okay. I think marriage just amplifies every other relationship that you have, you know? <laughs> and probably most more so even in our marriage, who people who know us, like we deeply love each other. Like neither of us would, be, would tell anyone that we would ever want to do life without each other, right? You'd better say yes. Um, <laughs> We love each other. There is a depth to our relationship, and I can stand here and tell you that, that, that we are deeply connected and we love each other, but the amount of times, because we're both pretty stubborn and opinionated, and so the amount of times where we look at each other, and I know that he's thinking the same thing I'm thinking, and thinking this, thinking, you are unreasonable and I am reasonable right now. What is wrong with you? Is it accurate, honey? <laughs> I'm saying it for you. I know that you must think this. Because we actually say it to each other. We're like, what is wrong with you? Like, why are you so upset right now? I'm not upset. You're upset. I'm not upset. You're upset. Clearly, we're both upset. Right? But how often, and we get really good, we get really good, especially as Christians, at doing this. I'll pray for you. You know, what's, you know what's really going on in your head? It's like, I don't know what's wrong with you. No, where does it come down to? It means like it comes from this place of thinking like, 
well, I don't know why you're being so unreasonable right now. I'm not sure why you're so upset about what you're talking about. This is not a big deal. Humility is a heart posture that says, you know what, you hurt, I hurt. Whether or not I get it or I understand it. Whether or not it seems important to me. You and I are a part of the one. Which means I don't get to remove myself from your pain. Because there's always a reason, right? If you learn to listen long enough, there's always a reason why people end up where they end up and why they seem to be acting um, irreasonable. What's the word? Not reasonable? Unreasonable, thank you. (laughs) Apparently I can't talk either. Just need a little humility, it's good. Um, There's always a reason. And our job as being a part of one another is to be humble enough to actually listen to what that reason is 